all family members have belongings that contain special meaning for them. And these belongings can remain meaningful to future generations of the family. Ideally, one plans for the transfer of their personal property in their will. But many times family members have to distribute objects for a parent or grandparent, making difficult decisions among themselves. To help with the challenges of inheritance planning and property transfer, we started creating research-based resources 25 years ago. The name, Who Gets Grandma's Yellow Pie Plate, is based on a true story shared by Andrea. Andrea's pie plate belonged to her great-grandmother, and it held a lot of special memories for her family. Almost everyone has a story like Andrea's and belongings that are priceless because of the memories they hold. Throughout this video, you'll hear just a few of these stories which I've collected over the years from different families as I've researched the topic, created the workbook, and facilitated workshops. Their names and small details have been changed to protect their privacy. At some point, you and your family members may need to make some challenging decisions about passing on personal possessions. With this video and our workbook as a guide, we hope to help optimize your inheritance planning and protect your family relationships across the generations. Decisions about passing on personal possessions often take place over time. When someone chooses or needs to downsize and moves, wants to give their possessions to others while they're alive, or following one's death. However, evidence suggests that most adults fail to plan ahead for these decisions. Many people die without a legal will indicating their wishes. And even if a will exists, few provide useful instructions for passing on their personal possessions. As a result, surviving family members and estate executors try working it out among themselves. This can lead to unnecessary stress, inaccurate assumptions, and family conflicts. Decisions about both titled and non-titled property are important. Individuals often understand the importance of making plans to transfer title property. This is property with evidence of ownership in a written document such as a title. Titled property includes land, a home, a vehicle, and financial assets such as stocks, bonds, or certificates of deposit. On the other hand, people often ignore decisions about their non-title property. Non-titled property includes all of the material possessions or stuff that we accumulate in our lives. Non-titled property doesn't have written proof of ownership. The value of personal possessions is in the eye of the beholder and may have a combination of emotional or financial value. I have some old blocks that I played with as a child when I was at my grandma's house. They have a lot of sentimental value to me, but probably wouldn't be worth anything at an antique store. My dad had a stamp collection, and none of his kids had any emotional attachment to it. We sold the collection for its cash value and divided the money among the siblings. My nieces and nephews were struggling with what to do with my sister Ruth's pottery. Of course, we all loved Ruth so much, but we thought the pottery was horrible. Like Amanda, Joe, and William, most of us have possessions that may or may not have emotional or financial value to others. Some of us have possessions we can't even give away. Nevertheless, personal possessions can be the biggest source of conflict for families, yet we often dismiss or ignore objects in our estate planning. As a result, non-title property, such as toys or collections, tend to cause more conflict in families than title property, such as inheritance of money. Many estate planning books and professionals recommend addressing passing on possessions by simply putting one line in your will. Would this work in your family? If you're shaking your head no, you're not alone. We tend to look at personal non-titled property decisions as legal or economic issues. In doing so, we fail to consider our inability to divide a unique possession equally or to put a monetary value on emotionally valued items. And perhaps most importantly, we fail to recognize the long and complicated family context in which these decisions take place across the generations. 
My mother's funeral was easy compared to cleaning out the family home and closing the door for the last time. Passing on personal possessions can involve a complex process of holding on and letting go of memories, family history, important relationships, and objects. So it's as much about memories and grieving the loss of the owner as it is about material objects. In many cases, these objects are tied to remembering and respecting family relationships, family history, rituals, and traditions. And when you combine the emotional meaning of personal possessions with the nature of family relationships, that's when the potential for conflict tends to happen. Decisions about who gets what property carry powerful messages, both intended and unintended. These decisions have consequences, especially for critical family relationships between parents and adult children, siblings, and step and biological children. Passing on personal possessions can symbolize love, trust to carry on family traditions, power, reward, or punishment. My dad remarried in his 60s, and his second wife and her kids moved into the home where I grew up. A few years later, my dad died suddenly, without a will, and his new wife inherited everything. Then one day, I noticed my stepsister was wearing my mom's favorite necklace. How did Barbara feel seeing the same necklace her mother wore for all of her family's special occasions? When there is little communication and planning, Surviving family members are left to make assumptions about the intended and unattended messages of older generations. For some people, decisions about personal possessions can be the last straw in a long history of conflict and struggles within the family. In other cases, these decisions can bring family members closer together to reconnect and learn more about their current lives. There are no magic formulas for making decisions about personal possessions. But there are six key factors that are critical for successful inheritance decisions and family relationships. These factors are grounded in what's been learned about families and inheritance decision making through years of research. While this video will include an overview of each factor, we encourage you to order the workbook for more tools and assistance to address each of these factors. Addressing these factors helps whether you are doing your own planning or working with family members before or after a death. Let's start by exploring the first factor. Recognize the sensitivity of the issue. What makes inheritance such a sensitive issue for families? Why is it so challenging to bring up and talk about? What do your experiences suggest? We live in a society that avoids topics related to death and dying, despite the reality that we all will die someday. This denial and avoidance of death, however, can make decisions more challenging in the long run. Bringing up issues of who should get what can be especially sensitive when there are estranged family members or family members who don't get along. Decisions about possessions can also reveal family secrets. For example, learning that dad is giving his book collection to a daughter who was given up for adoption and no one knew about it before. These discussions often require decisions about who should be included or excluded as receivers. Given how common divorce and remarriage are, inheritance decisions may involve determining if and how stepchildren or step-grandchildren should be included or excluded. Such decisions can also be sensitive due to concerns or fears about how one's motives might be interpreted as the receiver, including adult children and grandchildren. I constantly hear from adult children that their key motive for bringing up this issue is to understand their parents' wishes so they can carry them out in the future. Inheritance decisions can be sensitive because of fears the givers have as well. Research suggests that older parents are more likely to be open and accepting of estate planning conversations than adult children. What are the realities in your family? When my parents sat down with me to share their estate plans and documents, I don't remember the conversation because all I could think was, I don't want my parents to die. The details were too much to take in. 
Like Mateo, we all have fears that can keep us from having sensitive conversations about planning in advance. When it comes to inheritance planning or dividing possessions, how have you reacted? Before engaging in conversations, it's important to think about your motives and be willing to share them. And beware of making assumptions about other people's motives. Our workbook offers tips for talking about sensitive issues, including how to respond to common reasons for avoiding discussions and planning. Let's move on to the second key factor in decision making. Determine what you want to accomplish. Our goals often remain unidentified or unspoken. As a result, family members aren't on the same page. As the old saying goes, if you don't know where you're going, it's pretty hard to get there. There are five common goals related to passing on possessions. Of course, some of these goals will be more important to you than others, and the goals might mean different things to different family members. Maintaining privacy might include keeping decisions private within your family or avoiding public auctions or court cases. If you've ever been to an estate auction, you may have experienced the very public display of family members and strangers bidding against each other for a family heirloom. Some older adults are adamant about not having their possessions displayed for all to see. Others might not care. Protecting or improving family relationships is often a high priority for many families. In some families, this might mean preventing major family feuds. In other families, it might mean having a respectful discussion among siblings who haven't spoken in years. Perhaps your goal is simply to still be talking to each other after these decisions are over. Being fair is something most people can agree is important. But finding a common meaning of what fair means in your family will require some work. We'll discuss this more in a little bit. Passing on possessions can be a good way to keep family history, traditions, and memories alive for future generations. This might involve planning that helps keep family heirlooms and meaningful items from getting into the wrong hands. In some cases, you may want to leave a legacy by contributing to a favorite charity or cause. This could mean that financially valuable collections are sold or donated to an organization versus going to family members. It could also mean preserving the war medals and story of a parent's role at a local museum for all to share. Identifying what goals are important to you and the meaning of each goal is critical to helping guide decisions about personal possessions. Do you know what goals are most important to you and others involved in passing on possessions in your family? Our workbook includes helpful worksheets to help you determine what you want to accomplish. Let's look at the third decision-making factor. Decide what's fair in the context of your family. Being fair is often an important goal when making decisions about financial assets and personal possessions, but fair means different things to different people. Let's explore why being fair is more complex, especially when passing on personal possessions. I'm the oldest daughter in my family. My parents died within a few months of each other. They had a will but had not made decisions about their personal possessions. My sister, brother, and I went through the house and made decisions about who got what. It all went smoothly, except for one item, the Winnie the Pooh book that our parents read to each of us when we were young. It has always been on the bookshelf in the living room. Who should get the book in Julie's family? How should they make the decision? What would be fair and why? Fairness issues emerge in both the outcomes and the process. So determining what fair means needs to include negotiating both outcomes and processes. Most family members have unwritten and often unspoken rules about who should get what and how decisions should be made. When those rules are violated, decisions are considered unfair. Keep in mind that when family members feel the process has been fair, they're typically more willing to accept the outcome. We decided the book is staying where it has always been. My brothers moved into the house, and we get together a lot. We can't figure out who should get it, so for now, we can all enjoy it together. 
I've heard many different examples of what fair could mean in Julie's situation, from sharing the book to using birth order to drawing straws. It's likely that your family has never had specific conversations about what a fair inheritance means. Too often, individuals just assume that dividing money and personal possessions equally is the answer to being fair. There are typically two different ways to divide up possessions. One approach to being fair is to focus on treating everyone the same. That's equality. But as we see with the story of the Winnie the Pooh book, some items cannot be divided equally and still hold their meaning or value. Family members need to be creative when trying to achieve a sense of being equal. Rules can include allowing receivers to each select an equal number of meaningful items, ignoring the possible financial value. This can work as long as receivers don't want the same items. Or the rules can focus on creating an equal chance of receiving a possession by drawing straws or using monopoly money to stand in for real money. That helps even out differences in the socioeconomic status of adult children. Another common approach to being fair is to focus on taking the differences of receivers into account. That's being equitable. Differences may include personal characteristics, needs, or contributions of potential receivers. Recognizing personal characteristics of receivers is one way to determine who gets what personal possessions. Most owners want to know that their possessions are going to someone who cares about the object. This requires understanding what possessions others find meaningful. Sometimes personal characteristics of receivers are used as a rule for distributing possessions. For example, think of the many differences in family members that can exist. These range from birth order to gender to marital status. Other differences could include having children or not having children, whether they are biological or stepchildren or grandchildren. However, these types of characteristics are often considered unfair because they are often out of the control of individuals. Carefully consider how using such characteristics as a rule for distributing possessions can be a source of conflict and send unintended messages. Differences in needs or life situations of potential receivers can also be recognized when determining who gets what possessions. For example, personal possessions might be given to family members who are in need of basic necessities, such as dad's tool collection. Another attempt to be equitable is to recognize differences in contributions. Family members who have contributed to a parent's well-being may be rewarded with the giving of possessions. Should family members be rewarded for gifts, for caregiving, financial help, emotional support? Contributions come in different types and can be counted in different ways. And this can complicate determining who should get what possessions. In my family, everyone knows that you get back gifts you've given when someone dies, except for money and time. I'm the daughter who lives closest to mom and dad and takes them to their doctor appointments, cleans their house, and helps them out. But my sister from New York is always sending them expensive gifts for birthdays and holidays. Who do you think will get back the most when Kisha's mother and father die? It's hard to quantify the value of five years of caregiving or a close emotional relationship. Do adult children and their parents have the same expectations about fair giving and receiving? Recognizing differences may be considered fair in theory, but thinking through the details will be critical to whether other family members also consider those decisions to be fair. Our workbook includes tools to help both owners and potential receivers of personal possessions to sort out assumptions and beliefs about fair outcomes. Being fair requires paying attention to the process of decision-making as well as the outcomes. I'm the youngest son in a family of four kids. My parents raised us all in the same family home for 50 years. The home was full of possessions, but my folks refused to talk to any of us about inheritance issues, although they did make it known that they had a will. But when they died, we learned that their will said everything in the house was going to be sold at a public auction, no exceptions, and that the money was going to be divided equally among the four kids. 
if a family member wanted something, he or she could go to the auction and make a bid. That's an example of a decision process that the parents considered to be fair. What's your reaction? Would your view change if you were one of the siblings who has the lowest income and ability to bid? What if you wanted some family heirlooms and were forced to bid against your siblings and total strangers? My research on families and inheritance decisions focuses on identifying common judgment criteria that family members use in dividing personal possessions. There are four criteria that seem to be the most important, starting with participation criteria. Who gets to make or carry out decisions? Should property owners make decisions without consulting potential receivers? Should adult kids have input on what's fair? What about other stakeholders in the family, such as in-laws, grandchildren, aunts, or uncles? Consistency is important. The need to be informed is the second criteria that's most important to the process. This requires transparent communication with key individuals. Everyone involved needs to receive both accurate and complete information to be on the same page. My grandma promised her rocking chair to me in her will, but my aunt insisted on taking it no matter what. My brother-in-law appraised some of our family's antiques, and his estimates were way off. No one bothered to tell me is a common reaction to unfair processes. Sharing information in writing is a good way to keep everyone on the same page. Using available technology and private social media groups can help to quickly share inventory lists, feedback on who wants what, and important updates. A third criteria to consider when determining what a fair process should look like is to agree on the basic strategies of when, where, and how personal property decisions should be made. Will property owners leave written wishes to follow? Will family members make decisions immediately following a funeral, or will decisions wait for a period of time? What types of distribution methods will be used? Will family members be allowed to negotiate and trade items? Agreeing on fair ground rules for how decisions will be made is critical. And once you've established a process that seems fair for your family, everyone has to agree to follow it. Even after we agreed to wait to divide possessions for several months, our brother was in the garage taking tools when me and my sisters returned from the church after the funeral. As we learn with David's story, some family members will bend the rules, creating unfair processes for others. How people are treated is a fourth common criteria for judging if processes for dividing possessions are considered fair. There can be all kinds of rules established, but how do individuals actually experience the process? Family members often have unwritten expectations about what it means to treat each other ethically. That is, what do they consider right and wrong? Do they feel respected? Is everyone being honest or trustworthy with each other? One of my sisters took items when she thought none of us were looking. I was allowed to be at the table but didn't have a voice. No one listened to me. Remember these points about fairness. Expect that older parents, siblings, stepchildren, and others across the generations will have different perceptions of fairness. Take time to understand your family history. Are there stories about how possessions were divided and what was considered fair or unfair? And take time to understand family members' expectations about giving and receiving property as well as financial assets. Finally, negotiate what fair means for your family situation. The worksheets in the workbook are designed to help uncover assumptions as well as unwritten rules for fair outcomes and processes. Property owners and potential receivers are encouraged to learn where they agree and disagree as a critical part of negotiating. The hope is to find shared meaning of what being fair means in your family. Clearly, fairness is a big topic, but it's time to move on to the next decision-making factor. Understand that belongings have different meanings to different individuals. 
Older adults often want to ensure that their prized possessions and family heirlooms will go to individuals who truly value that possession. But how do you know what's valued by potential recipients? Remember that value is in the eye of the beholder. My sister loves this third generation antique clock because it reminds her of her great grandmother and wants to pass it down to her children. I don't have the same memories given our difference in age, but I see financial value in the clock and I could easily sell it and make a profit. It's so easy to make the wrong assumptions about who wants what and why. You never know who might care about what personal property. Parents are often surprised by the items their children treasure the most. My daughter just loves an old holiday decoration after all these years. Until recently, I had no idea it was her favorite. At the same time, some parents may be really disappointed that items they view as important are not valued by other family members. I'm a dad with two kids and I highly value my collection of fishing gear, but I'm not sure if anyone else in our family cares about them. Do you know what the yellow pie plates are in your family? Ask your family members what items have meaning to them and why. This can be done in many ways. You could mail a simple worksheet to family members for them to return. You could arrange a planning meeting to go through and discuss items in person. Or you could share a virtual inventory of possible possessions, along with photos if you want, via email or private social media group. Keep in mind that it is still the owners that should make final decisions about passing on their possessions. Understanding what others find meaningful can uncover surprises and potential conflicts and help to inform final decisions. In addition to finding out what items are meaningful to others, take time to share stories about what makes possessions so meaningful. Write down or record audio so that your stories can be remembered and shared by future generations. All too often, family members are left to clean out a home and don't have a clue about the stories and meaning that go with special items unless they've been shared over time. Let's move on to the next decision-making factor. Consider distribution options and consequences. How do you actually get rid of a lifetime of stuff and prized possessions? There's no one perfect method for distributing possessions. Each option has pros and cons, and one size doesn't fit all types of possessions or all families. If an individual dies without estate plans in place or their wishes known, state laws will apply. Every state has intestate and succession laws describing how both titled and non-titled property should be divided when there is no will. Non-titled property becomes part of the estate. The estate executor is then charged with determining how property should be distributed. It is often the adult siblings who are left to work out the passing on of possessions. Far too many individuals are not aware of who would inherit their assets if they die without a will. Visit nolo.com to find laws and probate information for your state. You can also work with an experienced probate and estate planning attorney to develop appropriate estate plans for your family's situation. Planning in advance gives property owners more choices and options that are aligned with their wishes and their goals. Having an up-to-date will and estate plan in place allows surviving family members to understand and carry out the owner's wishes without the burden of making assumptions, difficult conflicts, and costly legal battles. When making decisions about your personal possessions, the recommended approach is to create a legally recognized written list as part of a legal will, explaining who should get what property after your death. Most states allow individuals to simply indicate in their will that they have a separate list. Creating a separate list enables you to change it as needed without updating your entire will and paying extra attorney costs. Make sure you verify a separate list is legal in your state by consulting your state statutes or an estate planning attorney. It's important that the individuals named and the items to be transferred are specific enough 
that your list will be clearly understood. Property owners often use a written list for their most valued personal possessions or the pie plates that might be sources of conflict. You'll find a template for creating a separate list in our workbook. In practice, there are many different options for distributing personal property. Beware, as some of these options may be commonly used, but can clearly have negative outcomes. While a separate list may be appropriate for the most valued possessions, almost everyone has stuff that is better given to charities or thrift stores, shredded, or put in the trash. Gifting personal possessions while you are alive allows the stories to also be shared. I'll always cherish getting a handmade quilt from my grandmother as a wedding gift. Along with the quilt, I got a letter telling me all about how she had learned to quilt with her mom and the history of the quilts she'd made. This meant so much more than getting the quilt after her death. Although many people do it, labeling items with names on masking tape or post-it notes or making verbal promises are not legally binding methods of distribution. In some cases, labels tend to mysteriously disappear. In other cases, each grandchild may remember being promised the same item by grandpa. At auctions, your possessions can be bid upon in a public setting, or you can arrange a private auction process for family members only, online, or in person. Pilfering or taking something when no one is looking is considered unethical by many, but it is a reality in many families. Some family members may justify taking items to prevent someone else from getting it who might destroy or sell it. Keep in mind that sorting through a lifetime of personal possessions, your own or others, can be exhausting and can take endless hours. There are a range of professionals who can offer needed expertise and help in many communities. This brings us to our sixth and final decision-making factor. Agree to manage conflicts if they arise. After years of learning about and hearing family members' stories about inheritance, I can confidently say that major conflict is not a given. Many families navigate the challenges of passing on possessions without scars. That doesn't mean there won't be some disagreement or differences. But there are many examples of family members working together, achieving common goals, and celebrating a person's life while passing on personal possessions. That said, conflict tends to happen more when the property owner doesn't share their wishes prior to death. Research has shown four common sources of conflict that arise when dealing with passing on possessions. As I describe each one, think about your family history and current family dynamics. Which of these issues are likely to impact your decisions? Many of these potential conflicts can be avoided or better managed if they're discussed in advance. Not surprising, a lack of communication or miscommunication is a common source of conflict. I didn't know. That's not what I heard. All too often, the same messages are not heard by all stakeholders. This can be intentional or unintentional as decisions about passing on possessions occur over time. Individuals may say one thing and their actions say another, giving mixed messages. Different attitudes, beliefs, or values are inevitable among family members. Family history isn't important to me. I need the money, so let's sell everything. It's just old stuff. Toss it all. If and how these differences are known, recognized, and respected can impact decision making. Different expectations about roles is another potential source of conflict. Has there been discussion and agreement on who will do what, when, and why? I'm the attorney, so I'll decide. We don't need to involve the kids in our decisions. I'm the oldest. I'll be in charge. Recognize that family roles and relationships change after the death of both parents, especially among adult siblings. This can open the door for different expectations about who's in charge or who should be responsible. A fourth potential source of conflict is a history of unresolved conflicts. My father and I haven't spoken for years. My sister is still holding a grudge. I can't stand my in-laws and vice versa. 
The conflicts may be between older parents and adult siblings, between siblings, or involve in-laws and other family members. If two siblings have always had an ongoing rivalry, don't expect it to disappear in times of passing on possessions. Remember these tips. Respect the property owner's right to decide. It is their property. Acknowledge that family members will grieve and deal with loss in different ways over time. The loss of a parent, a family home, and a lifetime of possessions is stressful. Focus on where family members can agree and then agree to disagree when needed. Involve mediators or third parties. It can be helpful to get outside help recognizing and addressing sources of conflicts. Let's do a quick summary of the six key factors. One, understand why this issue may be sensitive within your family. Two, know your goals. Three, negotiate what fair means to your family. Four, understand that objects mean different things to different people. Five, figure out distribution options and consequences. And six, Agree to manage conflicts if they arise. Whether you're planning in advance to transfer your own personal possessions or working with family members to distribute property after a death, these factors can greatly improve your inheritance planning experience. While this video provides an introduction to the six issues, our workbook is designed to help you and your family members dive in and address the six key decision-making factors. The worksheets and written materials will help you sort out what's best for your family's situation. The workbook has proven to help family members jumpstart essential conversations and plan in advance for what can be a challenging decision. Visit our website to order the workbook and to access a variety of free planning resources. In addition to the print and electronic workbook, you'll find free quizzes, articles, and more we encourage you to share with others. The passing on of a lifetime of personal possessions to other generations doesn't have to be a nightmare. It can be a celebration of someone's life, providing a thread across the generations. We hope the ideas and strategies in this video will help you and your family jumpstart your inheritance planning while also protecting the relationships in your family. Thanks for watching. This is no ordinary yellow pie plate. This actually belonged to my great grandmother, and she spent a lot of time in the kitchen with her daughters baking pies. And the same has continued on through the generations. This pie plate holds a lot of special memories for my family.